All right. Uh, what I'd like to do with this first episode of Getting Dirty with Glenn and Garden Design is just help you gather some basic information that I do when I go out to a client's house. And uh, we'll start with some real basic things because usually what normally, well, usually what people do, they'll either buy, they'll have a new house or they're going to renovate the front of their house and they may get all the stuff ripped out and then they go to the garden center buy a lot of stuff, come back, and then go, okay, now we're going to plant it. That's the worst thing you can do. And what I'm suggesting is uh, if you develop this basic garden plan or layout of your house, you can take it to a knowledgeable garden center. Those are harder and harder to find. And they can help lay stuff out for you. Sometimes they'll do the design for free. Of course, there may not be a lot of value in that because it's free, but um, they can help you. Uh, get the right plants in the right place. Um, like I said, it does take time to get that great garden center. Let's talk some of the basic things. Obviously, we're going to need the uh, walls of the home, locations of windows. That's twofold. We want to be able to see gardens are supposed to be an extension of the interior space. You should be able to sit in a house, look out, and that garden makes the room feel bigger. You're going to want the downspouts and the direction of flow to see if it's maybe a hazard to have water running out across your driveway or walkway and there's ways to avoid that. You want any existing electrical outlets uh, located on your house because if you're going to put in maybe a water feature that needs a pump or uh, the best thing you can do is add outdoor lighting at night so you're going to need a place to put the transformer and then run the lights from. So where the electrical outlets is good. Direction to the slope or drainage it amazes me that I go to so many new homes and the house could have built one more block, could have been built one block higher and alleviated all the drainage problems. But you want to know if there's any drainage problems on the property. Um, then the compass direction of the front door. I would use, excuse me, use my iPhone, stand in front of the front door, uh, put, open up the compass app, take a screenshot and save that to the client's file so that I always know which way the front door is facing because that will help us identify the microclimates um, around the house because every side of the house has a different microclimate even though it might be a 5A or a 5B um, it will have its own microclimate on that side of the house. Now, I've got a red square right here by location of underground wires. This is a free service. Contractors are le legally obligated to call diggers and it depends what state you are in, what you call to get the underground wires dug. And the biggest mistake people make is they wait till they're ready to do the job to see where the underground wires are. I always call and have the underground utilities located before the first time I go meet with a client because I could come up with this great design and then all of a sudden I go to dig a hole where the water garden is going to be and oh look, that's where the gas line is or that's you know where the septic field is. Although, let me preface that, the underground utilities do not locate uh, septic fields. That is up to the owner to find or the builder to provide you with drawings where that kind of stuff is. It also does not locate any wires the homeowner might have run or an electrician might have run from inside the house to maybe a post light or to a pool or to something else that's outside that requires power. Those wires are also not located by calling diggers. But... Um, I would recommend calling diggers ahead of time and get any information you can about any possible underground wires, pipes, anything. Um, I have always lived out in the country, so well cap location and where are those wires and pipes running. Like I said, we already talked about septic fields. Existing drives or walkways. If it's an older home, if it's a new home, I often get to lay out where the walkway goes and the driveway. Um, take photos of all angles of the house if it's an existing house so you can take that to your local nursery and go okay here's what i'm looking at you know here's the space i have to work with and we'll talk about proper plant in the right place because so many i see unfortunately with landscape contractors most of the time you're ripping 30 to 40 percent of the plant material out because designers get paid a higher percentage of commission on plant material and they don't always uh, provide the right spacing for plants. But we'll talk about that in this or another video. And then the location of any existing vegetation that you intend to keep. 
You might have a plant there that can be saved through proper pruning or rejuvenation pruning. Um, you don't have to locate any trees. They're going to be ripped out. Um, but just make sure you have those. So let's go to the first thing here. All right, this is a very, very basic drawing of a house. The homes that I usually do gardens for are much more complicated on angles and squares. We're just talking rudimentary house here. You might just want to touch up the front of your house, and this is the beginning point. Up here, I always put a square here to, to see what scale this is at. Scale means like how far that distance is right here. And here, this distance is two feet. You can make this distance equal to one foot. It'll make your drawing much bigger. You can make this space between these two lines four or eight feet or ten feet. Ten feet is usually referred to as an engineering drawing. And it makes it'll shrink your drawing way down, but you can't see any details. I usually do it when I'm, you know, I may do a lot of drawings, but have it at two feet where each of these lines right here is two feet. So based on that, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The driveway is 24 feet wide, which is about average for a two-car um, driveway because you allow 10 to 12 feet if you want to allow ample space for the garage. Then the first thing you'll do is you'll get a tape measure out and you get somebody to get the idiot end of the tape measure, which means the end, <laughs> the end of the tape measure. And you just have them hold it and you go, okay, and you'll just go and you walk down here and you record this and you can say uh, it's 24 feet. So you come down here, you go over 12, mark it. This is four feet back. This is one, one, two, three, four, five spaces. That's 10 feet across. And you get the idea. You just keep measuring and using graph paper like this, it makes it real easy. You just have it on a clipboard outside. I do it on my iPad. That's what I'm recording this on. Um, because then I can share it with clients or vendors or whatever I need. It's just much more efficient. So the first thing you're going to do is measure the walls. And if you want to identify those as being walls, a lot of times what people do is they'll put a double line in here and just say, okay, these are the walls. Um, I don't have to do that because I know those are the walls. Um, but yeah. um, then you also need to measure like where the door is. Uh, how wide this is. This is one, two, three, four. This is a large door. This is an eight foot wide door. Um, so the, uh, on a lot of homes I work on, once again, that's a pretty common sized door to come into the house. But that is a wide door. We could shorten that up. And you also want to locate the windows, like I said. And then this is an existing slab, let's say here, which is Usually builders don't make it that big, but this slab is one, two, three, four, five, six. This is like a 10 to 12 foot wide slab by six foot. And my biggest complaint is they put these this little kind, tiny step in here and there's nowhere to meet or greet your friends. Um, if you have a bigger step like this, then you can say hello, goodbye, whatever. Especially here in the Midwest, goodbyes take like 20 minutes from the front door out to the car. Um, so I'm just going to say this is an existing slab. This represents a downspout. And usually the challenge is the roof will collect the water and now the downspout comes here. And if there's a slope, it'll drain the water across here. And depending which way this faces, if this faces, if this is the north side of the house, this water will run across here and freeze and be a slip and fall hazard for you. And we'll address ways in later videos on how to avoid that. Um, here's another drain right here. Another one drains out that way. So if you know which way it's going to drain, a lot of contractors will bury that, run pipe. It costs thousands of dollars. You don't need to do that. Um, you can put in-ground drains in. Once again, another video. Um, or you can just put what's called a, um, energy, um, uh, energy dissipator right here, which is really a pile of rocks. But that's what engineers call it when I work for an architectural engineering firm going to college. You put a rubber liner down, you make sure it's sloping away from the house, you put a bunch of rocks in here. No matter how hard it rains, it's going to be dissipated by the time it gets into your mulch here. And as, as long as this is sloping away from your house, you're not going to have problems with water going back into your basement. Um, this dotted line over here 
you could, if you've had the utilities mark, this could represent uh, a gas line or power, power coming into your house. Usually it comes into a couple different places. The gas may come in a different place than the, the electricity does. So you can mark that. Uh, in this case, I marked down that this is the south end of the house. It faces south. So this obviously is east. This is west over here. So we're just talking about, in this instance, um, the gardens that you could uh, build in this area, right? But this side of the house is going to be different than this side of the house. And right up against the house, especially with it's facing south, in the summer in the Midwest, it might be 80 degrees, but the reflective heat, depending on what the surface is of your house here, these plants right up against the house could get toasted because coming off the, the side of the building, I showed this to clients with my temperature uh, gun, that this could be 140 degrees and it's just going to fry these plants. So you've got to plant the plants far, far enough away. Those are things to consider. One thing that I did not mark on here is, well, we've got two things. Let's say we've got a water, oh, let me get the right thing here. Let's say we've got a water faucet right here. We might have another one over here. So you want to mark where the water faucets are because you want to leave space to coil a hose there and not have to crawl through shrubs. So you're going to want to know that, oh, I'm going to need a, a walkway, stone walkway coming in here so that I can get to the hose bib. Um, and the other thing, I'm not sure if I touched on it, is electrical. You need to know that. Um, you'll need to know the electrical, once again, for transformers. I think I did talk about that. So that's the very basic information you need to note, as well as, like I said, noting that the slope is going away, that you don't have water coming over your driveway and running into your house. And once you have this to scale, then a lot of times this is what builders do, okay? Builders, because it's the least expensive thing, they'll put in a four foot wide walkway, which is very uncomfortable for two people to walk on. Comes right to the front door. There's no slab here. Uh, there's a slab up here, but this is very narrow walkway. There'll be some low growing evergreens, some flowering spirea, probably a burning bush here that's gonna block the view from this window, this window, and probably grow out far enough that it's gonna restrict the easy flow of your car in here. And then they'll put some plants in here. Um, it's very boring landscape wise because this is what I call landscaping because you can see everything at once. When you look at a, what's the difference between that and a garden is like you experience a garden, you look at landscaping. When you're coming down the walk, the driveway and you're walking down here, there's nothing to stop your eye. It just keeps going. There should be something here to stop your eye if you want to create a garden. So that's your basic plan right there. Let's go to a little bit different. Now, uh, and you see this a lot in Japanese style gardens, is to put their walkways in staggered uh, form like this. And that's twofold. One, they believe that evil spirits travel in a, uh, let's go back here, travel in a straight line. And if you walk back and forth, that evil spirit must might go right past you. Of course, I think, well, what happened if you moved into a path of another evil spirit that was just walking by? But I like the concept of that. More importantly, they do this over water particularly, because if your walkway is like this over water, you have to look down to make sure you're not falling in water. That's not the case here, because this is all turf and you know soil or whatever. But if you stagger this walkway like this, this is eight feet wide here, six here, it's like eight feet wide here. Um, it forces you to look down and you might put a really interesting perennial tucked in here or maybe another one coming along the edge in here. So you might want to do something like that. So let's go down to this last option. This is more garden-like. Um, also, this goes up in cost, obviously, as you go. Um, this could be a concrete walkway, a just poured concrete, flat work, they call it. This could be a stamped concrete walkway. Uh, if you get those installed correctly, they will last forever and they look great and they don't fade. They just need to be sealed every couple of years. Um, the most costly option, but really nice, is pavers. Doing a 
you know, serpentine walkway like this is very tough with pavers because it requires, requires so many cuts along the edge, it's insane. But they look great coming in here. Or any kind of stone, it could be flagstone set in concrete. I don't recommend that because the concrete's going to crack at some time. I'm not a big fan of flagstone walkways because there's so many drawbacks. But now when you come down here, you can't see the front door because you're going to have some kind of a specimen tree here. It might be a service berry, a columnar hornbeam, something like that. And it's planted close enough to the walkway that when it is mature, that you'll be walking underneath it like in a Frank Lloyd Wright house where he changed the ceiling heights inside um, so that you experience different things as you walk through the through there. So you get some height in here. You could have it so it just comes up to the edge of the walkway. You could have it so it just this shows it in the walkway, but it's not. It's actually over. Same thing down here. And what's really nice about this is when you start to come in here and let's change colors. If we come in here and go, okay, we're going to put some uplights on this tree right here. And I'm going to put some uplights on this tree right here. And maybe even in this one. And so now you don't even need any pathway lights because the lights on these trees are probably bright enough and yet soft that it will light up the walkway. Let me take those out of here. Um, so you can make that a little more complicated. Um, and then this would represent like a mass planting and perennials. I like mass plantings. I think they're more impressive. Cottage gardens where you have 40 different perennials look great. It takes a while to get established, much harder to maintain, especially for homeowners. And if you're a passionate garden gardener, yeah, you might want a cottage garden. But for most homeowners, mass plantings of hosta in here, um, maybe heuchera in here, who knows? Uh, some other great plant over there. So that's just the basic, very, very basics. Once you get this sketch drawn, if we go back to here, once you get this sketch drawn into scale, then you can take it, like I said, to a knowledgeable garden center, usually locally owned, and then they can come in here and they should have a circle template, and they can put it on here if they know that the scale is uh, one square equals two inches. They can come in here and start to draw the plants, and they should be drawn at 80% of mature size so that they're, it looks nice when it goes in, but it'll look even nicer for the next five to ten years, maybe forever with these shrubs. Because if you get these plants in here correctly, spacing, you shouldn't have to prune them or prune them very very infrequently. Uh, if they're planted too close together, you're constantly pruning them. So that's what I want to talk about in this first episode of how to design a garden. Hopefully you'll join us for the other episodes. Uh, this is Getting Dirty with Glenn, and I will see you out in the garden.